So tell me, what is it that makes this sound pretty nice and this sound discordant? What is it, specifically physically, that makes one sound pleasant and the other makes us cringe just a little? Let's find out. Hi everyone, I'm Jeff. Welcome back to Sound and Voltage. On this channel, I cover topics around modular synths, synth technology, and unusual musical and sound design techniques. I don't monetize this channel, I don't take sponsors, so if you end up enjoying this video, consider hitting the like button and subscribing. It really helps the channel. Over the last week or so, I've put out the first few parts of my special series on frequency modulation and FM synthesis. One of the big decisions we make when setting up an FM patch is the relative frequencies of the two oscillators and how it affects the creation of extra frequencies, sidebands. I was going to do my next video on that, but as I was preparing for it, I realized that in order to explain some of that, I really needed to talk about this first. What is it that makes two tones sound like they're stable and working together, or like they're unstable and fighting each other? I'm going to approach this in a few different ways. One is as a ratio of frequencies. Then we'll look at the actual waveforms and psychoacoustics, how our brain interprets the physical stimulus of what we're hearing. And finally, we're going to look at it in terms of harmonics. There's a lot to get through, but I feel like we're going to learn a fair bit along the way. So let's come back to the question I opened with. Why does this sound nicer than this? Each example is two notes played simultaneously. One of those notes is an A, so the only thing that was different was the pitch of the second note, or more specifically, the interval, the distance between that A and the other note. What is so different between those two intervals that we interpret one as pleasing and the other less so? Both intervals are rooted at A. The first example we heard also included an E, making it a perfect fifth above, so that makes sense, fifths always sound good. The second example is just the A and the A sharp, one semitone up. Again, not too surprising when you see it. Everyone knows that if you just smack two keys on the keyboard next to each other, it's gonna make a sound that's on the spicy side of things and best used sparingly. But those aren't really answers, just appeals to common wisdom, things everyone knows in quotation marks. We could lean into the music theory a bit, Chords are built up out of major and minor thirds to create fifths. It's practically the backbone of the Western music tradition. But that just tells us that we like fifths a lot. It doesn't say anything about why we don't like the minor second with only that single semitone separating the notes. Another aspect of music theory we could look at is to compare the frequencies of each note and look at the ratios between the upper and lower notes. Both intervals started with the A, the A at 220 hertz. That first example had an E, that's above it, comes in at 330 hertz. The A sharp, on the other hand, is 233 hertz and some change. The specific frequencies don't really matter, though. It's the relationship of each against the root that matters. So take the example of the fifth, with the E at 330, comparing that against the A at 220. The ratio of them, once you divide out the common factor of 110, is 3 to 2. That seems pretty nice to deal with. We know that a full octave increase is a ratio of 2 to 1, so a fifth being something reasonable like 3 to 2 makes sense. What about the minor second example? There the ratio is 233 to 220 and, well, actually, there is no simpler version than that. Actually, we might see this simplified down and say it's 16 to 15. That's the difference between just intonation, which is a tuning system based on integer ratio specifically, and equal temperament, where we split the octave up into 12 equal parts. Each of them is used for different reasons, and digging in there isn't really the goal of this video. Synths are generally going to use equal temperament, especially Eurorack synths, where we use one volt to represent an increase of one octave, so each semitone is an equal one twelfth of that octave. The end result, though, is that the ratios don't always work out very nice, but whether or not we think of it as 233 to 220 or 16 to 15, there's no doubting that it's not as simple a ratio as 2 to 1 for an octave or 3 to 2 for a fifth. So that's one step further than just the common wisdom telling us that a fifth sounds nicer than the two adjacent keys. It's predictive. The niceness of the ratio of the frequency says something about how pleasant the resulting sound is going to be. We can probably guess that a ratio of 2 to 1 is going to sound better than a ratio of 21 to 11. And that's useful to be sure, but it isn't why we perceive one is nicer than the other. I mean, when we're listening to those intervals, we aren't thinking about the numbers. So maybe let's look at the two waveforms and how they're interacting. I could bring this up on an oscilloscope and you can see the same thing, but it's easier to see if I just animate it here. We're starting with the root note, the A at 220 hertz. Now let's overlay the E at 330. Let me pause here. This is simplified a bit because I'm assuming the two waves are in phase with each other, 
But take a look at this, at how these two waves form this nice pattern. That two to three ratio means that for every two cycles of the first wave, it'll take the same time as three cycles of the second wave. Now I'm representing these two individually, but that's not how it arrives in our ear. Instead, these two are combined, and the two waves are going to interfere with each other, either constructively or destructively. Where both the waves are positive, we get constructive interference, and the two waves are going to reinforce each other. Where one of them is positive and the other is negative, they're going to destructively interfere and tend to cancel out. Because everything is nicely lined up in a 3 to 2 ratio, we get this relatively short repeating pattern, just the sort of thing our brain is good at identifying and perceiving as a stable sound. Now let's look at the other example, where we had the A at 220 Hz and the A sharp at 233. We'll start with just the two overlaid waves and, well, this is a bit of a mess. And at the same scale, it's kind of hard to get the big picture of what's happening, so I'll zoom out. Okay, now we can see that the two waveforms go through a long cycle of being lined up and then getting out of alignment for a while and then getting lined back up again. Let's look at the two together. Huh, that's interesting. In some ways, this looks like a simpler result than the first example. There aren't any weird reverses, everything seems nice and symmetric, it's just a sine wave that's being amplitude modulated. But this outwardly well-behaved result hides some issues that end up being a problem for how we perceive it. First, that nice well-behaved sine wave isn't at either of our original frequencies. It's not 220 or 233 Hz. Instead, it's right in the middle between them. So it's coming in around 226, 227 Hz. But then this rhythmic rise and fall in amplitude and volume, that's happening 13 times a second. This is the beat frequency, and it's equal to the frequency difference between the two tones. 233 minus 220 equals 13, and so the volume is gonna rise and fall that many times a second. So that's weird. And our brains aren't good with that. 13 times a second is too fast for us to perceive as individual events, but it's too slow to be resolved into the sound as a whole. Combining those two effects, we get an unexpected tone that isn't in tune with either of the inputs and which is flickering on and off a dozen times a second. Yeah, our brains don't like that. Okay, so that tells us a bit about why we don't like one of them. It doesn't say much about why we do like the sound of the other. So let's look at what happens with the harmonics. And this is what I wanted to get to in terms of the next video on frequency modulation. So just as a quick recap, any periodic wave, like a triangle wave, sawtooth, square wave, can be broken down into a series of sine waves. It has a fundamental frequency, that's just the frequency of the tone being played, in our case 220 hertz. But it also has a harmonic series above it, which are just the multiples of that fundamental. So here it is for a sawtooth wave. In addition to the fundamental, we see frequency components, harmonics or overtones, at 440 hertz, 660, 880, 1100. How much of each of these harmonics that we have is what dictates the quality of the sound. A square wave has a different amount of each harmonic, in fact, half of them are missing. But the strength of them aside, they'll always appear at 440, 660, 880, etc., multiples of that fundamental. If instead of A at 220, we used one octave down at uh, 110, then the harmonics would appear at 110, 220, 330, 440, 550, 660. And the 220 hertz tone has them at 220, 440, 660, 880. The frequency components for the combined tones are exactly the same as the harmonics for the 110 hertz tone. Only half the harmonics are bouncing up and down. That's actually just an artifact of having two oscillators that aren't dialed in exactly equal. If we did, it would look like this. Well, no wonder that a 2 to 1 octave sounds stable. It's all the same darn frequencies. So how about our 3 to 2 ratio for the fifth? We've got the 220 hertz tone, which will have harmonics at 440, 660, 880, 1100, 1320. But we also have the 330 hertz tone, which has harmonics at 660, 990, and 1320. Again, we see a bunch of them lining up and reinforcing each other. There are a few of them that are missing, but that happens. And leaving that aside, notice that they're all at 110 hertz steps. In some ways, this seems like it's really a 110 hertz tone, with harmonics all spaced out at 110 hertz increments, only we're missing the fundamental. It's not as perfectly lined up as the octaves were, but all the harmonics are multiples of 110, and most of them are there. This would be a natural contender for some sort of 110 hertz waveform, if only it wasn't missing that fundamental. In many ways, we can even treat this as sort of a virtual 110 hertz tone, and we're going to see more of that when we come back to the FM video. That's pretty neat. So, by comparison, let's look at the spectra for 220 hertz and 233 hertz. Yeah, gross. Nothing lines up with anything else. It seems like 
well, it seems like they're just two different sounds playing at the same time, not a unified whole. We do see that sometimes these harmonics are coming in pairs, but check out the values of those pairs, they aren't equal. This pair is 32 hertz apart, this pair is 40, these two are 52 apart. Remember the example we had with the beating between the two sine waves? Well, that was just two sine waves. Each one of these harmonics is a sine wave, and now we've got all these pairs, especially the low frequency ones, and each of them is interacting with each other, each causing their own little beating between them, and all at different rates. Yeah, this is why nobody likes you, minor second. So now we have an answer to the question of why does one sound good? Because the harmonics are all lined up nicely and reinforce each other. And why one sounds bad? Because the harmonics are all unrelated and jumbled. And this, right here, is what I want you to have in mind when we come back to frequency modulation in the next video. I think things are going to make a lot more sense. Well, that's it. I know we went through a lot here in a short period of time, but I hope this little excursion was helpful. If it was, maybe consider liking and subscribing. Thanks for watching.